Hello everyone. Today we will uh, talk about uh, in uh, the section of applied ethics about this uh, notion of sexuality. Now, uh, when we have talked about ethics and about various uh, a philosophical way of looking at morals, their foundations, uh, we have discovered that there are many theories and uh, uh, ways of decision making. Then we uh, came out to see how do these theories get applied in day to day lives, how are decisions, how human beings make decisions and consciously or um, not so, they are dependent upon uh, uh, the theories that we implicitly or explicitly uh, assume. Today, we will talk about uh, an issue, which is considered immensely moral by uh, uh, a large majority of people. Um, uh, which is the issue of sexuality. And that is why it, it also brings about the notions of taboo and uh, uh, there are perhaps in most cultures, there are do's and don'ts about sexuality, which are, uh, which do not originate perhaps from the physicality of sexuality, but from the morality uh, associated around uh, sexuality. We will primarily look at, I uh, will recommend you to go uh, through these two essay. Uh, that is recommended uh, to have a uh, preliminary understanding of the issues that we are talking about. Of course, this does not, is, uh, today's uh, uh, session is not limited to these articles, but these two uh, pieces will definitely give you a very good idea about what we are talking about. Now, the first one is Vincent C. Punzo's Morality and Human Sexuality. It is a part of Reflective Naturalism. Uh, these uh, and the second one is Alan H. Goldman's Plain Sex or Philosophy. Uh, published in Philosophy and Public Affairs in 1977. The first one, Vincent P. Punzo proposes a non-reductionist view of sexuality and Alan Goldman proposes a, a reductionist view of sexuality and you can guess it from the name when it calls it, uh, when Goldman calls it plain sex and uh, uh, Punzo of course talks about morality and human sexuality. If your institution or if you are subscribed to Jester, you will also be able to uh, uh, find the second article on Jester, and uh, uh, both these articles should be freely available on the uh, internet if you search them out. So, my citations are primarily to these two articles, however, they are not limited to these two uh, pieces, they are also an expression of my views and my understanding of the subject. Now, sexuality uh, has been very strongly connected to morality in most cultures. Perhaps it is the single natural function surrounded and most moral dictates. So, we find that we have many natural functions regarding eating, regard, say uh, various natural functions that we perform as physical beings. And uh, uh, of course, all of them uh, um, confront or are surrounded with, uh, with, with uh, uh, behavioral restrictions from uh, which may be termed from etiquettes to uh, moral uh, uh, guidelines. But, sexuality in particular, perhaps in most cultures is the single most, uh, is the natural function that, uh, single natural function that confronts the most moral dictates. So, uh, to start with, we need to analyze this notion, that what is this notion of sexuality? How we conceive this notion crucially determines our moral opinions on the issue. We shall proceed in these exercise, in this exercise from two perspectives the reductionist and the non-reductionist view. Okay. Now, considering uh, sexuality, laying the uh, background there, let me say, we, we, we make judgments about people, we make judgments about uh, 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 relationships, we make, we make judgments about uh, dressing, about so many things that surround sexuality. Let us start with a few examples, that what, what is it that uh, uh, makes uh, uh, sexuality of a uh, uh, moral issue and uh, why is it that uh, so many morals confront it and how is it that we find various decision making and various questions uh, surrounding this domain of sexuality. Let us think of some of the uh, sexual debates of our times. Uh, if you are coming from more conservative societies, you would find that the way uh, men and women dress uh, 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 and, and, and uh, uh, how physically revealing it is, seems to be an objectionable matter, because it seems to exhibit sexual intent. If you are coming from more liberal societies, it still does not mean that you are uh, 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 away, away from sexuality, because then it performs, it, it comes around 
uh, in various other forms say uh, what should be a legal stand on homosexuality, whether homosexuality is something which needs to be legislated out or which seems to, which needs to be legislated in. Uh, what about this institution of marriage? Why uh, uh, is monogamy uh, necessarily also uh, 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 tied up with fidelity? Why is uh, sexuality with more than one partners uh, a moral uh, dilemma? What does the act of uh, uh, sexuality convey? So, uh, there, there are various problems uh, on the surface that appear, uh, but which all crucially boil down to how we conceptualize uh, sexuality and sex. That how is it, uh, uh, how, how does, how, how do we conceive or what do we understand that uh, sexuality entails. So, uh, let us think of more problems and I am sure you can come up with uh, even more problems from your immediate environment or from a, a more global perspective. Uh, uh, what kind of uh, clothes young people should wear? Uh, what kind of time a, uh, young people should spend with each other? What is the level of intimacy? Is sexuality um, a measure of intimacy? or does intimacy or um, any, any sexuality or any act of sex that, uh, 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 that does not promise intimacy, does it make it tabooed or something morally uh, incorrect with it. So, uh, let us think of more examples, let us think of uh, uh, does, does uh, human emotive uh, abilities uh, connect with this physicality that we uh, uh, have around sexuality. As human beings, how, how far should uh, sexuality govern uh, the behavior, the interaction between people? So, um, it, it, it varies in various perspectives that uh, what kind of clothes people should wear, how, what kind of intimacy people should display, what kind of intimacy people should have, what kind of intimacy people should display in public and various other uh, issues that surround the core area of sexuality. We find that uh, there can be so many uh, uh, problems that arise around sexuality and legislations that take place according. In India recently, uh, homosexuality was decriminalized and then again the Supreme Court made a judgment that well, it uh, debunking the decriminalization uh, dictated from the lower courts. So, this is again when we have legislation around this. I wish that uh, we all lived in our own universes and where others views did not matter to us, but we do have shared space and that is what, that is what brings about the need for uh, uh, discussion on morality and ethics, because we need to develop a consensus, because we live in a shared space. So, over the various uh, 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 lectures on ethics that we have had, uh, one thing perhaps crucially comes out that uh, we need to engage in a debate uh, to come around to as far a resolution as possible on whatever grounds we can arrive at them, uh, because we live in a shared space and the shared space entails uh, absolute plurality of behavior as not permissible, uh, not even logically permissible. Thereof, there is a need to have a streamlining of permissible versus non-permissible behavior. So, now, uh, let us come to uh, uh, analyzing this notion of uh, sexuality that we talk about. We have talked about, if you look at the slide, we will see that uh, what we have talked about right now is that uh, sexuality is uh, strongly connected to morality in most cultures. And uh, we will begin with what with uh, an analysis of this notion. Uh, now, there is something, uh, there is nothing new about it that uh, philosophers can add. But of course, it, when we analyze this from a distance or from a philosophical perspective, there are perhaps many of our hidden presuppositions and assumptions that are unknown to us, which do surface when we engage in this activity of explicit analysis of this notion of sex and sexuality. So, because we start with the analysis of this notion of sexuality, because this determines what kind of opinions we have on the issues. So, we shall proceed in this exercise from two perspective, the reductionist and the non-reductionist view. Now, we will start with the reductionist view. Before that, a quick take on what is reductionism. In various contexts, we have talked about uh, reductionism and non-reductionism, which are uh, philosophical uh, uh, positions. 
uh, about uh, various phenomena. So, when we talk about uh, uh, as, as perhaps uh, many of you would guess that reductionism is the act of uh, uh, reducing one phenomena in terms of the other without loss of meaning. And non-reductionism is perhaps is, is granting uh, uh, atomicity or axiomatic uh, uh, foundation to one phenomena, which may be correlated with another phenomena, but which definitely cannot be understood in terms of the other phenomena without loss of meaning. So, we can uh, an example, a classical example of reduction would be that well, we can understand uh, the color green as uh, a certain wavelength, but uh, the color green cannot be reduced to a certain wavelength, because when we talk about the wavelength, we leave about the qualia or the perceptual feel of color that we have. So, uh, for the reductionist uh, about an issue, or the reductionist would like to understand an issue in terms of uh, another uh, more a baser and more fundamental phenomena, which will be uh, 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 which will completely explain the uh, other phenomena without any loss of meaning. So, uh, simplifying it, reducing it into uh, building blocks, whereas the non reductionist would claim that well, we cannot do such a reduction without the loss of meaning. We can have a correlation. We uh, say a non reductionist about the mind would say that. Uh, we, we can correlate mental phenomena to uh, the neural or physical activities in the brain or the nervous system, but we cannot reduce mental activities to uh, uh, brain activities without loss of meaning. So, there may be a correlation that yes, every time when I get angry, a certain part of my brain uh, gets fired up, but my getting angry is not the same thing as the brain firing up or that portion of the brain firing up. Uh, only when I, I when I get angry is something more than that portion of my brain firing up. It is that perceptual feel that cannot be understood or cannot be comprehended in terms of that particular region of the brain firing up. So, this is basically the difference between uh, reductionism and uh, non reductionists. Uh, on a meta ethical theory, when we talked about meta ethics, we also uh, dwelt upon uh, dwelled on uh, uh, how values uh, um, uh, were attempted to be reduced to facts uh, and uh, uh, possibilities where values were non reducible and definitely not reducible to facts. Uh, say uh, for the utilitarian, uh, all values would uh, were reducible to anything that promotes happiness or physical or well being of mankind, which is uh, a more um, empirical and physically uh, measurable phenomena than. Uh, say uh, holding a value as uh, intrinsically good, because not because of its uh, physical or uh, perceivable consequences. So, non reductionist about values would say that well certain things are uh, uh, valuable in themselves and uh, there we cannot reduce them to any further domain, we cannot reduce them to facts at least to uh, comprehend its meaning. So, uh, a non reductionist about uh, 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 values would say that well, if I follow my, if I follow the principles of justice, it may lead to welfare of the society, but uh, which is a fact. But uh, welfare of society is not the fundamental reason for pursuing justice. And justice, by itself, perhaps um, has a uh, uh, an intuitive appeal, which is not limited to the welfare that it brings along, because there can be perceivable cases where even or there can be imaginable cases, where uh, the welfare of the society is not brought about by following uh, principles of justice. But again, the uh, reductionist would on the other hand argue that well, uh, considering a short term view or a long term view, there can be a variation in the uh, uh, that, um, uh, that values do ultimately reduce to fact. So, these are two sides of a debate. And perhaps to understand sexuality, we will start with the uh, these two perspectives on sexuality. So, now coming to the reductionist view as you see on the slide, we talk about uh, uh, Goldman would be the classic case we take of uh, sexuality uh, in the reductionist sense. Goldman points out about the means end analysis of sexuality, which views sexuality as the means to various ends to reproduce, to love, to communicate, to express commitment and various other means. Now, this kind of a means and end analysis 
ignores granting any force to the primal desire for physicality often refer referred as the animality, animality of sex. Reactionists of various strains may or may not ignore the above ascribed ends, but are unanimous in granting the physicality component of sex as an undeniable motivation and unapologetically so. So, what is Goldman saying over here? Well, Goldman is trying to conceptualize that what do we consider uh, or conceptually analyze this notion of uh, sexuality. Now, conventionally Goldman points out that we find that uh, uh, sexuality and sex undergo uh, 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 a means end analysis. So, sex is never as an end in itself, but is a means to something. Uh, it is a means to uh, uh, communicate uh, with a partner, it is a means to uh, 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 convey affection, it is a means to uh, uh, love, to communicate, to express commitment, of course, it is a means to reproduce also. So, these seems to be, these seem to be the end for which sexuality is a, uh, is the means. Now, uh, this kind of an uh, means end analysis, where uh, sexuality is seen as a means to various ends, uh, seems to leave out or underestimate, if not leave out the primal physical component of sexuality. That uh, the pleasure emanating out of uh, uh, the act of sex is a fundamental motivation for uh, sexuality, seems to be left out by such a means end analysis. Now, this is nothing new and this is nothing revelatory, but this is trying to analyze why uh, uh, do we have uh, so many moral notions around sexuality. Now, for Goldman this kind of a and uh, as he rightly titles his uh, paper as plain sex, he says that well, uh, this kind of means and analysis eliminates the immediate physicality or uh, uh, the animality as many would refer to of uh, uh, sexuality. And this is as uh, seen in the last bullet on the slide, is this is the, this is what the reductionists argue against that well, uh, there may be many offshoots of uh, sexuality, which could include uh, reproduction and to love, to communicate, to express commitment, but fundamentally it is a, a physical act and the uh, pleasure emanating out of it is the fundamental undeniable motivation and there is nothing to be apologetic about it. So, reductionists of various strains uh, accept the effects uh, may or may not accept the ascribed above ascribed ends, but what they are unanimous is that uh, granting in granting the physicality component of sexuality as an undeniable motivation and unapologetically so. So, now let us look at the argument. What does the reductionist argue about? The reductionist argues well, for one, conventionally all the ascribed ends to sex are taken as the rightful motivation for sex and anything else, particularly physicality is considered as perversion. Now, it is to be noted that well, when it is mentioned that anything else apart from these ascribed ends. Uh, is considered as a perversion. Now, two, the reductionist objects to this conventional conceptualization, that the fundamental no motivation is not only ignored in such a conceptualization, but is also wrongly wronged. So, there is this big error that is being made in conceptualizing sexuality as a means to whatever ends uh, as ascribed in the earlier slide at the cost of arguing out uh, sexuality, uh, uh, arguing out the physicality of uh, sexuality. Now, so what uh, the reductionist is trying to say that sexual desire is, essent is essentially a desire for sexual contact and the pleasure emanating thereof and ignoring this is a fundamental error in conceptualization. Now, this is a very strong reductionist argument about sexuality, that sexuality is fundamentally and ultimately physical and 
the pleasure emanating out of it is the primary and uh, fund fundamental and the ultimate motivation of it. Now, if you notice the entire taboo and the moral dilemmas and uh, dictates and the entire plethora of moral engagement around morality depends on this fundamental conceptualization that we have. That is sexuality uh, uh, a physical act and nothing else or it is uh, everything else and by the way it is also a physical act with uh, physical pleasure coming in. So, uh, uh, a more Victorian morality would offer uh, would, would consider sexuality as sin as uh, especially when it is uh, beyond the rules of the or uh, established rules or custom of the uh, social uh, domain. Now, sex and sin go together very often. So, uh, for the reductionist, uh, uh, the reductionist brings back the physical element to sexuality and tries to uh, uh, explicate that well foundationally and fundamentally sexual, uh, sexuality is physicality and it is a physical act and uh, desired for the pleasure that comes uh, out from it. Now, if this is so, now imagine this answers uh, takes a new direction or uh, not new direction in the sense that it has not been taken before, but this takes a different direction from established uh, customs and uh, moral claims about it. That uh, ultimately is uh, 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 it is coming on uh, it uh, hinges upon the libertarian principle that as long as uh, nobody else is harmed, uh, it does not matter what kind of uh, 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 act it is and society or governance or politics has no business in entering into uh, an act between people. Now, for the reductionist, what are the claims that we can see that come off? That we can, uh, what the reductionist is saying, uh, what the reductionist is definitely not saying that um, sexuality is only a physical act for uh, physical purposes, as many would perhaps uncharitably condemn the reductionist. But what the sexuality, uh, what the reductionist is saying that sexuality is essentially a physical act, and you may choose it to uh, portray uh, the various supposed beauties of human life, of, of human associations, of communication, of love, of affection. You may choose it as an instrument to communicate. Uh, so many things. You may choose it as an instrument for love, you may choose it as an instrument for uh, uh, various other uh, uh, supposedly higher ascribed ideals, but it nevertheless is foundationally, fundamentally sexual or physical and that uh, it cannot be done away with. And we need to take into account that before we, uh, we, we uh, put this, this uh, act in and uh, 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 give it a moral color to this. So, the extreme reductionist could of course, come and say that well, uh, there is no business of any uh, value assignment or value assessment on this particular uh, uh, issue, that morality is, is uh, that sexuality is definitely and fundamentally a sexual issue, a uh, physical issue sorry, and thereof it does not, uh, uh, does not at all come in the domain of morality and what you may think or what society may propose is just a, a, a subjective value creation around sexuality. It is interesting to see how issues are intertwined together, because this uh, uh, I understand it is also as a, a, a conflict between uh, the two versions of liberty or freedom as positive liberty and negative liberty. That well, uh, for the, from the non-reductionist perspectives, which we will talk about later in detail but uh, that, that justifies or that tries to explain that there are values surrounding sexuality and we must educate and uh, guide uh, uh, our generations through these uh, uh, well trodden uh, paths for, for them to realize the full beauty of life and the association that they have together. So, the non reductionist on the other hand would like to say uh, especially the one uh, who is uh, uh, who is uh, very firm about uh, the moral component of sexuality, is that we need like positive liberty, we need to uh, uh, get people to 
to, to goad them into rules or these customs around sexuality, so that they can um, reach the full potential and, and uh, uh, celebrate or reach the higher ideal, which they would perhaps not ordinarily reach, uh, if, if negative liberty would be followed, where uh, they would say that it is our fundamental drive. And, uh, uh, if we are not cultured or cultivated into it, uh, we, 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 uh, we, we um, collapse into the default mode that is in us. Uh, let me repeat an example, which I have perhaps given in one of the earlier lectures, that the positive libertarians say that, well, uh, uh, freedom about anything, say even about sexuality, as I give an analogy with, depends on how one is cultured to appreciate it. The classical analogy or the example that I am referring to, is when I talked about classical music. So, unless one is trained in the syntax of classical music, perhaps one cannot enjoy classical music. Now, if I were following negative liberty, I would say that, well, let me play a piece of classical music versus a piece of popular music. To the untrained listener, perhaps most often it will be the popular music that would appeal, rather than the classical music. Now, the negative libertarians would say that, well, uh, the final choice is with the individual and let the individual choose. The positive libertarians on the other hand would say that, well, if I, uh, if we do not uh, uh, cultivate or we do not uh, uh, enlighten uh, a listener about the nuances and the uh, syntax and the grammar of uh, 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 classical music, it is simply unfair uh, for, the ju uh, for, for the listener to make uh, an informed choice between uh, the two mu pieces of music paid, uh, played. Uh, the popular music is bound to appeal more to the untrained uh, uh, listener. So, uh, positive liberty would say that we need to culture and uh, uh, certain uh, or we need to train the listener and which does involve an uh, infringement of uh, the listener's liberty, but which ultimately makes the listener uh, make an uh, uh, informed choice. So, basically, uh, many moral and philosophical um, uh, issues can be understood under this great division between positive liberty and negative liberty. So, sexuality could be one for an instance, because the non-reductionists would say that to uh, uh, not uh, goad uh, people by into uh, moral customs around sexuality, we allow the default mode in us, which is essentially biological, to overrule us, or to take over. And till we do not, uh, this, this default mode would uh, give a negative liberty would take over, and uh, uh, one would perhaps not benefit from the uh, wisdom of the ages. So, the positive libertarians on the other hand would say that, we need these moral customs around uh, uh, sexuality or anything for that matter, to let us reach the epitome of sexuality or any act for that matter. So, uh, this is how of course, we can understand the debate between the reductionist and the non-reductionist, between the ones who affirm uh, positive liberty, which says that well to realize freedom, one needs to surrender one's freedom at the beginning, to evolve, to learn, and then to realize one's freedom. Whereas, negative uh, liberty would perhaps uh, argue for freedom right at the beginning, and that the individual is rational enough to choose that, uh, to surrender his or her own freedom to uh, reach that level. So, this essentially brings about the dilemma between these two strains of thinking, of positive liberty, negative liberty, of reductionism and uh, non-reductionism. So, uh, for uh, now, when we are trying to understand uh, reductionism or the reductionist view of sexuality, we see point number three, that uh, sexual desire is essentially a desire for sexual contact and the immediate pleasure emanating thereof. And ignoring this is a fundamental error in conceptualization. Uh, let us look at some other features of, uh, uh, if you read the slide. Right now, let us look at some other features of um, the reductionist view of sexuality. It says, uh, it talks about uh, physical acts and uh, the role, uh, that is not a they, that is the role they play uh, in survival. Uh, so, just as hunger 
uh, plays a role in nourishment. So, uh, this is contiguous with the uh, understanding that sex as a uh, pleasurable for ev evolutionary reason or for furthering species. Mm, a desire for sex is not the same as the desire for reproduction, companionship, communication or any other psychological manifestation that it has become. Self-consciousness and technology bring in choice. Okay, we will talk about the last issue later, but let us just take the first uh, three points uh, together. Now, uh, there seems to be quite a popular theory uh, or, or a popular belief that uh, sex is required for uh, reproduction and uh, evolution of uh, or, or, or for the tr uh, transmission of species and for species to grow and uh, uh, propagate. And that is why uh, this intense physical desire has been uh, is as a part of our biological makeup. Uh, but for the reductionist here, uh, he uh, would perhaps not like to uh, succumb to this uh, argument that uh, the uh, physicality of uh, sexuality is only because of uh, uh, reproduction. Because continuing with the means end analysis, uh, uh, the reductionist did say that well, these are perhaps the various ends that sexuality serves, but uh, it is definitely not confined as the motivation for. Uh, uh, confined to uh, these ends as the motivation for uh, sexuality and it could be intrinsically uh, valuable because of the pleasure it uh, emanates. So, things like that the popular evolutionary example, if you look at the slide the second uh, issue, the popular evolutionary example uh, or evolutionary reason given for furthering species that is uh, evolutionary reason for sexuality is, is simply because uh, in order to further species. Now, for the reductionist, if you uh, look at the third issue, it is the desire for the sex, uh, desire for sex is not the same as desire for reproduction, companionship, communication or any other psychological manifestations, manifestation that it has become. Now, there are many manifestations about uh, uh, psychology, there are many psychological manifestations about sexuality and that seem to become the ends for which sexuality is uh, serves as means. But, uh, the reductionist makes a clear cut distinction that well the desire for sex is not the same as the desire for any of these, be it uh, the biological or evolutionary uh, reproduction, companionship, communication or any other psychological uh, manifestation that it has become. So, this is making a clear epistemological difference between the desire uh, for sex itself and the desire and, and all the other consequences that come along with it. Now, coming to it on a little further note, um, when the last uh, point raises on the slide that self consciousness and technology bring in choice and more to choose from, social and moral regulation finds uh, find its roots here. So, uh, if you look at this, well this is a crucial issue that or, or a shift that is being made that well uh, uh, the very fact that human beings are as a, as a, a form of entity. Uh, uh, in this world are unique because of uh, their ability uh, to uh, uh, be self aware. And this self awareness clubbed with technology uh, uh, is able to wedge uh, these supposed ends to sexuality from the uh, very act itself. That it is no more uh, uh, required that uh, reproduction necessarily follows from uh, sexuality. So, uh, this is the, the choice that technology has brought in with various forms of contraception and self consciousness gives us this choice to choose the technology and to choose uh, what we ought to do in this domain. And this is where social and moral regulation come in and they find our roots here because of the uh, implications of being self aware and also having the technology to, uh, to separate these supposed ends from uh, the means as the means and analysis holds it. Now, it, it is in this space that is created that uh, religion intervenes in this choice and choosing that primarily self awareness and secondarily technology entail. The premise being that the above two that is uh, the choice and the ability to choose or the spread of the choice or the and the ability to choose allow for enormous exhaustion of our natural appetites which is ultimately detrimental. Now, that is the contestation here. 
So, when very often when religious and moral uh, institutions or proponents of religious and moral diktats attack the reductionist using their own tools of empirical or scientific uh, evidence, they would claim that uh, in a newer scenario, in a scenario when human beings are self-aware uh, primarily and secondarily the technology has entailed the ability of separating uh, the means from the ends and the ends are uh, of uh, regarding sexuality and the ends regarding sexuality are not necessarily, do not necessarily follow from the means, that is when we have an element of choice and a widespread to choose from. A self-awareness giving the power of choice is, is perhaps a, a longer uh, uh, ability with hu the human race and technology maybe over the past two or three centuries has enabled or has enhanced the uh, spread of choice in uh, this field. So, these two factors being combined there seems to be a possibility of enormous exhaustion of our natural appetites, which is ultimately detrimental. And that is the contestation. If you would find that many enthusiasts would perhaps analyze that, well, we now produce uh, more food than uh, what we need to have, and we have the ability to uh, enjoy food as a delicacy or as a, as a aesthetic desire rather than uh, for nourishment. And primarily, the aim of hunger was to uh, ask the animal in us to um, consume food to, to nourish its own self. But this hunger and the pleasure that uh, this hunger uh, and the pleasure that came out of the satiation of which uh, is now abused because of uh, one of our self awareness and uh, now uh, secondarily as technology or as affluence enables for us to have a wide choice. And this leads us to emphasize on the means uh, which was uh, just a signal for uh, getting in nourishment into the creature now becomes a source of pleasure and therefore keeps on repeating and therefore uh, chronic problems of uh, of medical problems of uh, regarding the excesses of food consumption do come into uh, existence now that is what uh, is contested that uh, ma many enthusiasts would find the justification from this perspective religious regulation of sexuality finds its authority in such an appeal a case of positive liberty, uh, goading individuals via moral diktats away from excesses and its eventual detrimental consequences. So, this is where uh, religious regulation of sexuality comes into being that it, uh, um, it seems to be a paradigm case of positive liberty, where because of the possibility of self, because of self awareness and the enormous uh, possibility from technology, we can have the act without what were earlier considered as essential consequences of it. And therefore, there tends to be tendency to, to slide into excesses of this and uh, which perhaps has been shown to be eventually detrimental in its consequences. But again, now for the reductionist, well that would be an abuse of any uh, natural appetite that we have and uh, uh, the responsibility for it rests with uh, the person himself or herself. Now, let us look at another uh, uh, commonly held uh, uh, view, which the reductionist attacks that well, sex as communication or the vehicle of love. Now, this is an often eulogized feature of sex that seeks to be ver the very goal of it and anything bereft of this is alleged meaningless. Uh, so, the reductionist would dispute this dismissal or downgrading, downgrading of the physical pleasure component of uh, sex meaning cannot be lost on eliminating the communicative function. If there is no communicative function, the must much eulogized communicative function of uh, uh, feature of uh, sexuality that has turned out or as the reductionists allege that it turns out that this seems to be seen as the goal of it and that uh, when communication is lost, uh, meaning is uh, lost in that f function. So, that is where the reductionist disagrees and of course, and as an exception and, and, and the reductionist often cites that love can be communicated in various other ways. Thus, what philosophically the reductionist would like to establish is that love, commitment, loyalty are ontologically distinct from uh, sex or sexuality and having this clear distinction does away with many troubles. In fact, the last point very clearly communicates the philosophical standpoint of the reductionist about sexuality, citing the independence of these notions and 
the, the troubles and the moralization of uh, sexuality occurs because uh, we fail to make this distinction between uh, love, commitment, loyalty and other such values and uh, sexuality. And this uh, distinction is the source of many troubles. So, well finally, what is the reductionist saying? Let us bullet it point by point. Well, for one, the reductionist is arguing against any exclusively moral categorization of sexuality. Sexuality is as much and only as much in the purview of morality as any human interaction is, nothing exclusive because of the nature of it. So, it is definitely not that uh, the reductionist is claiming that sexuality is beyond the purview of morality, but uh, what the reductionist is simply saying is that uh, sexuality is only in the purview of morality by the nature of it being a human interaction and nothing not in the purview or not peculiarly in any peculiar purview of morality because of the nature of it. So, a common uh, uh, retort to this has been by making um, people who are opposed reductionists would like to claim that well, uh, what about sexual offences? They seem to be immoral and they are immoral and what is the justification of it? But then the answer for this is very clear from the philosophical understanding that the reductionist propagates. In the second point, uh, it is said that sexual offences are offences only because of the deceit, coercion and violence in it. Their being sexual is a mere coincidence and this in no way affects the moral status of the act or offence. So, uh, any sexual offence is uh, immoral, not because it is sexual, but because of the other value components in it. So, uh, a rape is immoral because it is an act of unauthorized violation of a person's body. It is an act of violence, it is an act of coercion, it is an uh, and thereby, uh, it is an act against somebody's will and thereby it is uh, immoral and thereby it entails the uh, consequences that it does. So, but that it is sexual does not alter the moral st uh, standing of the act or offence. And this is a crucial claim that uh, the reductionists would uh, make. So, now uh, going ahead, this view contests many of the established views on morality governing sexuality. For instance, there is no justification and this is how the, the third point brings about consequences of such a reductionist world view. That well, we do not do away with morals regarding uh, sexuality, but there is nothing uh, what it just goes on as a consequence of the um, ontology of difference between sexuality and other values is that um, there is nothing peculiarly moral about uh, uh, sexual acts by their being sexual. They are moral only by their being human, by, by their being uh, acts of human interaction. So, what are the consequences that uh, follow from this? Now, the consequences that follow from this is that well, the established views on morality or uh, established views governing sexuality. For instance, there is no justification to associate fidelity with sexuality unless it is voluntarily agreed to. So, this is a crucial conclusion that uh, or a consequence of the claim by the reductionist. When the reductionist uh, makes a claim that well, uh, uh, when a court of law holds fidelity uh, as, as uh, uh, or infidelity as a, a violation of uh, commitment and, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, punishable or uh, uh, cognizable, it is uh, uh, following the reductionist argument, it is cognizable only if it has been an explicit mutual agreement between the partners uh, and then it has been violated. But if it is not and it is thereby just the reason uh, that violation of any contract is uh, punishable, because all the parties in a contract mutually agreed to uh, such an arrangement. So, uh, uh, infidelity is, is uh, 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 something wrong only because or only if all the partners have agreed to it. So, if all the partners have agreed, have not agreed to uh, uh, pursuing fidelity, then it does not automatically become uh, uh, incorrect. So, uh, associating loyalty with fidelity seems to be uh, the, uh, the uh, failure to make a, or the ontological dis uh, distinction between uh, values like loyalty and uh, uh, commitment with sexuality. Now, if you look further consequences of this, uh, we would see that uh, confusing love with sex brings forth many unnecessarily 
many unnecessary, unnatural and unjustified dilemmas. So, in fact, the entire idea of uh, the Victorian ethos can be very well traced to this failure to make this distinction between what according to the reductionist are apparently very clear and distinct concepts, the concepts of uh, uh, loyalty, commitment and uh, other values like this versus uh, um, the physical sexuality. So, uh, not being able to make this difference brings about many unnecessary, unnatural and unjustified dilemmas. Reductionism about sexuality is not the same as reducing love. Now, however, making these claims, it is, it is uh, uh, not unexpected that uh, uh, many of us would perhaps feel uh, strongly uh, about reductionism as being something which is reducing uh, human interaction to a pithy state. Well, definitely no. What reductionism about sexuality is saying is that uh, sexuality is physical and that is it. It is not uh, uh, saying this, it is not attempting to reduce love or the various other values of commitment and human interaction. The argument herewith only makes sexuality independent of certain other values. Uh, so, unless the agents themselves, uh, themselves choose to associate them. So, that this, this central point needs to be read carefully, this second bullet, that because it conveys the ethos or the philosophy claim of uh, reductionism about sexuality. So, it is definitely not reducing any other values, what it says is that sexuality is sexuality and nothing else. And associating anything else with sexuality is a matter of choice of the agents themselves, but intrinsically there is nothing associated with sexuality. And making this or, or um, going further to the next uh, point, when a prolonged history of the majority uh, making this above mentioned association may have led to this conceptual binding of what has been shown to be independent concepts. Continuing to hold this unjustified conceptual binding simply leads to unjustified moral judgments. So, uh, as, as uh, I conclude from what um, comes from the reductionist view that well, sexuality and other values are ontologically distinct, but we have a prolonged history for the majority of uh, uh, humankind making this above associ uh, this uh, association. And this association or this conceptual binding uh, of which what has been shown by the reductionist as independent concepts le uh, leads to unjustified moral judgments, simply because the majority have been associating sexuality with morality. And uh, that does not entail that uh, we can always do this for everyone and uh, as long as people choose to associate it with it, they are welcome to do so. But uh, finding an intrinsic association with the two uh, uh, domains of morality and sexuality uh, and thereby making it binding on everybody else is an unjustified moral judgment. So, the pleasure, uh, well, uh, on a final note, when uh, the reductionist puts out well, which is, uh, uh, if, if we tend to have a view that well, uh, perhaps the um, reductionist is overemphasizing the importance of uh, uh, sexuality and underemphasizing the importance of human relations, then we have, under, uh, we have misunderstood the reductionist. The reductionist equally cherishes the values of uh, uh, what may be called the higher values of human interaction. What the reductionist only does is that she or he separates the conceptual binding, the unjustified conceptual binding between these higher values that we call on one hand and sexuality on the other hand. So, we can have a, uh, a sexual domain which is amoral, which does not uh, uh, intrinsically connect with any uh, other values. However, if the agents choose to associate the two, that is the agent's choice and if it is mutually agreed to and then there is a violation, of course, that is uh, 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 immoral, because it is a violation of human uh, uh, mutuality, uh, which was previously agreed upon and that is why it is a violation. Again, the reductionist does not overemphasize the, uh, 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 the, the, uh, the importance of sexuality. If you look at the last, uh, but one uh, uh, point made over here that the pleasure associated with sexuality is non-cumulative and that is a reason why it cannot be held as a lasting value for a lifetime. Now, uh, these are uh, Goldman's views 
uh, and Goldman does temper down uh, uh, reductionism, which may seem to have an air of uh, uh, over emphasis on sexuality. Uh, uh, he does tone it down by saying that, well, the pleasure associated with sexuality is non-cumulative and repetitive. And that is why it is a reason that it cannot be of lasting value for a lifetime, and thus perhaps a feeble component of the good life. And so, Goldman does admit that, uh, without any compromise in his position of reductionism, that uh, the pleasure associated with sexuality is definitely uh, non-cumulative, and thereby it is not of a lasting value. And thus, perhaps, uh, does not necessarily uh, per, uh, associate itself with the component of good life. So, this is a uh, perhaps a rational look at uh, uh, what a reductionistic or any view of sexuality or the physical component of sexuality takes uh, in, the, in the larger domain of the good life. So, as Goldman finally claims that uh, sex affords us a paradigm of pleasure, but not a cornerstone of value. So, well, yes. The, um, Goldman does admit that, well, sexuality is definitely not of uh, the kind of uh, value that uh, perhaps other human uh, values like loyalty and uh, uh, friendship and commitment are. Uh, in fact, sexuality is not a value at all. And uh, therefore, uh, we can, uh, uh, what, what even Goldman would agree on a meaningful life or a value rich life would necessarily not include uh, the pleasures of sexuality, because they do not seem to contribute. In fact, by making sexuality physical, Goldman is doing away with any uh, value implications for better or for worse for the domain of sexuality. So, um, sexuality is no more being uh, seen as a uh, as as a uh, uh, as a supreme value that adds or uh, to the good life, rather it is being seen as a, a source of pleasure, which does not add in the accumulation of a good life. So, it is as he says, in by saying that it does afford us a paradigm of pleasure, but it is definitely not a cornerstone of value. Now, we come to the non-reductionist view of sexuality.